Stories of human-animal hybrids have existed for centuries, from the ancient Greeks to modern Hollywood cinema. As humans, we've always held a fear and reject the idea of science meddling with genetics in uncomfortable ways. Creating wild stories of half-human, half-beast monsters or conspiracy theories of hushed-up, top-secret laboratories operating on man-made mutations, the fundamental fear of the hybrid has persisted. Our mythology, folk tales, and conspiracies have created fictional accounts which horrify some and morbidly entertain others. But whilst the story of Stalin's desire to create a half-man, half-ape super-warrior army may be entirely fictional, the science behind stories such as these is far from made up. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Welcome to Dark Histories Series 4 episode, I don't even know, I think it's 5, might be 6, definitely not 4, could be 4, don't know, I think it's 5, let's call it 5. Welcome to Dark Histories Season 4 Episode 5, I hope you're all doing well, hope you've all had a great couple of weeks. Today we're going to do a really fun episode I think, um, it's an episode that I thought after last week's fashe kind of crawling around in the gutter, we sort of stayed down there a little bit but switch gears a bit and do something a bit fun. So I kind of did this one, which I thought was really fun. And I have to say, actually, the next few episodes I've got lined up, I'm really excited about all of them. I mean, I enjoy all the Dark Histories topics, but I, I'm kind of especially excited about the next few episodes because they're all kind of, I don't know, just things that I'm, I can get really into. So yeah, I want to start the show off, as always, just by saying thanks to for downloading and listening. Um, and thanks also to all the people who support new patrons. We got our... Jen, Rara Borealis, Tiffany, Marquis Ondore, which is a very cool name, I like that very much, Rachel, Louis, Emma, Susie, Samantha, Joy, Sophie and Heidi. So thanks very much for your support. It's uh, greatly received as always. I think that's probably it. I don't think I really have any big housekeeping to get into this week. Things have been quite quiet on that front actually for a while now. So yeah, let's get on with it, I guess. This is... Chimeras, Ilya Ivanov and the Human Z. Throughout history, monstrous abominations have filled the pages of books on mythology and fiction. From the Chimera of the Greeks, with the head of a lion, tail of a serpent and body of a goat, to modern science fiction and horror, stories such as The Island of Dr. Moreau, 28 Days Later and The Fly, Human-animal hybrids can even be seen in our most base religious imagery, with the devil's goat's horns and cloven hooves. Whilst if we go back, the ancient Egyptians saw all manner of deities realised in the arts as anthropomorphic animals. The human-animal hybrids are often used to instil fear, the resulting monsters being violent and somehow less human. Oftentimes they're slaves to their more bestial half, the results being a warning on the decline in moral value. Yet somewhere down the line, we've learned to draw a line at what is acceptable, not scary or, or morally troublesome. Cell tissue and organs are transplanted from animals into humans with very little fuss, and daily almost all of us use products that contain sources of animal tissue. When it comes to human-ape hybrids, the stories burrow further into our modern-day folklore and give birth to various conspiracy theories. Stalin's quest for ape-man super-warriors, or scientists forced to experiment in the Russian gulags are numerous, but patently untrue. These days, they exist as a Cold War throwback more than anything else. As with much folklore, however, the roots are based in reality, and the long-held fear of a hybridised monster that has pervaded throughout popular culture for centuries has not always deterred some scientists from trying. In the 1760s, Georges-Louis Leclerc a French naturalist and author first wrote of the similarities between humans and apes, forming what would eventually be the precursor to Darwin's theory of evolution. Whilst he showed little interest in hybridisation himself, he did write of the viability of fertility if such a cross were to happen. With the turn of the 20th century, attempts to carry out xenotransplants became more and more common when the first ever kidney transplant taken from the rabbit was put inside a 16-year-old boy with kidney failure in 1905 though the patient sadly died two weeks later. As surgeons practiced splicing various organs from pigs, rabbits and primates into other humans, 
so too did the theoretical possibilities expand. Xeno transplants might have been several steps away from hybridizing, but it only took someone to dream big, and it wasn't long before several such people arrived on the scene proposing exactly that. The Dutch naturalist Herman Marie Bernalo Moen proposed experiments with hybridization with a goal to prove evolutionary theory alongside Herman Rohleder in 1908. His project was backed by the Pasteur Institute in France right up to the Dutch Royal Court. However, the funding fell short after a brochure was published to the public entitled Truth, Experimental Research into the Lineage of Man. Once the wider population had read the details of the experiment, feelings turned sour on the idea. Two years later, along came Ilya Ivanov. Ivanov was a Russian scientist who had climbed to international renown with his experiments in artificial insemination, and in 1910, he put his theories forward on the theoretical possibility of hybridizing humans and apes. Once again, the idea was largely frowned upon by the public, and Ivanov was forced to place his project into the background. But Ivanov wasn't going to let it go so easily. All he needed was the right sort of audience. Ilya Ivanov was born in Shigri, Russia in 1870, growing up in a small town nestled on the western border between Russia and the Ukraine with a population of around 12,000. The Ivanovs were comfortable members of the Russian middle class. His father worked as a clerk in the district treasury and his mother was the daughter of a relatively wealthy landowning family. In 1890, Ivanov graduated from the Saskaya Gymnasium in Ukraine, going on to study at both the University of Moscow and the University of Kharkov. His postgraduate studies saw him travel further abroad, working in biochemistry and microbiology labs in the University of St. Petersburg in Geneva. He was a voracious learner and active in many societies throughout his education, including becoming a member of the Petersburg Society of Natural Scientists one of the oldest educational societies in Russia, founded during the imperial era under the director of Russia's leading universities. Throughout the 1890s, Ivanov began to work on the theory behind artificial insemination for agricultural purposes. He spent a year in Paris at the Pasteur Institute in 1897, furthering his work in the field, and published a paper two years later entitled Artificial Impregnation of Mammals within which he argued that artificial insemination of livestock was an essential step in the progress of Russian farming. Although the theory wasn't wildly new, and Russia was already practicing artificial insemination within its fish farms, the public was still wary of this method of producing animals, and Ivanov's theories drew some initial friction. Surprisingly, it wasn't really moral concerns which incited the controversy against Ivanov's paper, but rather the popular belief at the time that animals resulting from artificial insemination would be somehow of lesser quality than those born naturally. Ivanov argued strongly against this, and he pointed to the Russian fish stocks as evidence that the animals could, if anything, only be improved. Ultimately, it was undeniable that the harsh environments of rural Russia made keeping livestock difficult, and so, in 1901, Ivanov founded the world's first centre built for a programme to artificially inseminate horses under the umbrella of the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Over the following years, he not only entirely solved the shortage of horses within Russia, expanding the project to a national scale, but began dabbling in selective breeding and hybridisation in order to solve problems with the animals that were specific to Russia. He created animals that were hardier in the cold environments and more resistant to illness and disease as well as purportedly hybridising a horse and a zebra, along with mixing up yaks, bison and aurochs. It was groundbreaking work that drew the interest of breeders and scientists the world over. This work had elevated Ivanov within the international scientific community, but his ambitions didn't stop with horses. In 1910, he presented his theories of hybridising humans and apes via the means of artificial insemination to the International Zoological Congress in Graz. Whilst it may have seemed like the next logical step for Ivanov, it was a bold departure from his work with horses, and he quickly found that his new theories didn't go over quite so well with all members of the scientific community. For the time being, at least, he was forced to bench his project until he could find a more receptive audience if he was to gain any level of financial backing. Whilst the theories themselves were reasonably in step with the evolutionary theories of the day, 
and were generally framed comfortably within the racist, sexist, colonial ideas that prevailed at the time, dabbling with human hybridization had proven to be just a small step too far. In the meantime, Ivanov went on to work as the director of the Animal Reproductive Biology Faculty at the State Institute of Experimental Veterinary Medicine. It was a full 14 years before he found the possibility of a second chance to present his theory, this time to the recently established Bolshevik government in Russia. Seizing on the strategic anti-religious aims of the government, he presented his application for state funding for the project, heavily emphasising the religious implications of a successful venture. The debates over whether or not the project should be backed plodded on for over a year throughout all levels of government. The top official intellectuals broadly found Ivanov's proposals agreeable, whilst his fellow scientists remained more sceptical. Fortunately for Ivanov, among his supporters were people very high up the chain. Nikolai Gorbanov, the Kremlin's chief of staff throughout the 1920s and close friend of Lenin and Trotsky being just one. Finally, in September 1925, the Bolshevik government, motivated upon futurist ideals, agreed to sponsor the project and secured Ivanov funds to the tune of $10,000. This he was to use for his initial expeditions to Africa to secure a source of apes and carry out his initial experiment. Together with his son, a Browning pistol and a somewhat rare permit to travel abroad, Ivanov boarded a ship bound for French Guinea in West Africa where he would finally carry out his grand plan. One of the stumbling blocks and a major factor in stalling the project for Ivanov was the relative rarity of captive apes available for use in scientific endeavours. The apes were difficult to catch, rarely survived for very long in captivity in their homelands and fared even worse once sent abroad. This ultimately led to anyone wishing to work with primates having to either pay the exorbitant prices on the open market or funded an expedition into the unknown lands of tropical rainforests, complete with malaria and abundant dangerous wildlife, making it a difficult prospect for all but the most adventurous explorers. When his ship landed in Conakry on the outskirts of Carmayen on the west coast of Africa and part of French Guinea, Ivanov's first port of call was the already established botanical gardens owned by the Pasteur Institute, with whom he'd already secured a working relationship and the permission to set up his laboratory within the facility. From the get-go, however, he encountered new problems which sought to derail the program. The institute was in something of a sorry state and Ivanov quickly found out that over half of the apes caught there to be later transferred to the Pasteur Institute in Paris would die long before their departure date. The locals, suspicious of his ties with Paris, were unwelcoming, and worse, he found that many held deep cultural beliefs that prejudiced them against working alongside the apes. One of these beliefs was that the apes were prone to raping local women, who then found themselves outcast by their communities. For Ivanov, the story proved to bolster his resolve that humans and apes were close enough to hybridise. However, at the same time, it did present him with one problem. His initial plans were to inseminate local women with the sperm of apes, paying the women off for their troubles in a fantastic display of the colonial attitudes of the early 20th century. However, he had come up with this plan before he was able to anticipate the strong social implications that would find the women ostracised, rendering volunteers impossible to find. For the time being, he pressed on, organising expeditions into Futa Jalon, a vast highland region of Guinea dotted with deep green, tree-filled canyons and craters. It would have been a challenging environment for the Russian scientist, but it proved fruitful and saw the team returning with 13 chimpanzees. With the likelihood of volunteers teetering between slim and none, Ivanov was forced to change tact. Rather than inseminate the local women, he would instead procure human sperm and inseminate female chimps. This, he decided, would be better done without the locals' knowledge, and so, before dawn, under the cover of darkness, he snuck into the laboratory to carry out the first experiment. The two apes he used in the experiments were numbered two and three, and named Babette and Sivette. Ivanov artificially inseminated the subjects with sperm that he only noted as not donated by him nor his son. The experiment promptly failed when a month later the chimps showed no signs of pregnancy, and so Ivanov tried once more. Once again, the sperm donor was kept anonymous, 
Though Ivanov wrote that it was freshly collected from a man of 30 years old. He also noted that the donor was a bachelor, although, according to his claims, there have already been conceptions from him. The ape used was number 25 and named Black, and just like before, Black remained assuredly unpregnant. Dejective, Ivanov switched gears once more, this time proposing to inseminate local women without their consent or knowledge under the guise of a medical exam. Fortunately for just about everyone involved, the local French governor disallowed it with what Ivanov called bourgeois prejudice. He turned to Moscow, writing home for backup, but the reply from Moscow was the same and they disallowed the practice also. Ivanov had been in Africa for six months, utilised three apes and a considerable sum of money and his attempts had only ended in failure. He still felt a conviction that human subjects being inseminated would be the cheaper, more practical option to carry the project forward and so he returned to Russia, placing the failures of Africa behind him and planned his next steps. Once back in Russia, Ivanov found that his research and experimentation had not passed the world by quietly. In 1926, the American and British press had both picked up on his theories, publishing sensationalist, religious frame pieces. In America, evolution had been a hot-button topic for several years, as debates on whether or not evolutionary theory was acceptable to be taught in schools fled within the press. Just a year prior, in 1925, the state of Tennessee had passed a law that made it a crime to teach any theory that denies the story of the divine creation of man as taught in the Bible. The preceding trial had been one of the first modern media trials in America, which the press dubbed as the Monkey Trial. Prime amongst the evolution argument was a group called the American Association for Advancement of Atheism, an anti-religious association that had previously worked with Ivanov in order to help fund his African expedition. Speaking to the New York Times in 1926, they spoke openly about their funding of the project, albeit inexplicably filtering the entire thing through a heavily racist lens. Soviets backed plan to test evolution, experiments to be carried out at Pasteur Institute in Kindia, Africa. Lawyer for the American Atheistic Society tells of project and will go to observe it. Charles Smith, president of the American Association for the Advancement of Atheism, said yesterday that experiments fostered by that association, by the Soviet government, and by scientists and other individuals had been started at the Pasteur Institute of Kindia, French West Africa, with the object of accomplishing the artificial hybridization of the human and anthropoid species, to support the doctrine of evolution by establishing close kinship between man and the higher apes. Mr. Smith asserted that news of the arrangements for his experiment had been brought to this country by Hal S. England, a Detroit lawyer who had represented the association on the lecture platform. The late Professor Clarch, Dr. F. G. Cruikshank, and others have proposed such experiments, said Mr. Smith. The Soviet government has actually made a grant of $10,000 towards the proposed experiment. A total of $100,000 may be necessary to carry on the study of such experiments over a period of years. Some word of these experiments has come to this country already, as they have been attacked in two or three religious publications as revolting. The prejudice against the experiments, however, is entertained by those who do not know anything about modern methods of artificial fecundation. Free use of the laboratories and grounds has been extended to us, but it will require a fund of $100,000 to carry out the work. The Russian government having borne the initial cost, several prominent American patrons of science have become interested, and the foundation will doubtless be named for the principal donor. Within a short time, as support is forthcoming, I shall leave for Kindia to assist in conducting the experiments. Back in Moscow, Ivanov had been securing further funding from the government. Upon his return, Ivanov had arranged for the transportation of 20 chimpanzees to Russia. However, the trip had been traumatic, and by the time that they arrived, only four had survived. Using these apes, he founded a primatological nursery under the newly created Institute of Experimental Endocrinology, Already deciding that he would use primate sperm and artificially inseminate human women, Ivanov next set about finding five volunteers who would be willing to take part in the experiments. It was decided that no money should exchange hands between the institute and the volunteers, 
and that they must be willing to donate their bodies to science for the sake of progress. Unbelievably, Ivanov did find at least one volunteer named only G who wrote to him to apply. Dear Professor, with my private life in ruins, I don't see any sense in future existence. But when I think that I could do a service for science, I feel enough courage to contact you. I beg you, don't refuse me. Even off larger problems were the apes, which kept dying, and the Institute quickly found themselves left with only one, a 26-year-old orangutan named Tarzan. New apes were ordered, however in 1930, before they were delivered, Ilya Ivanov was arrested in a widespread purge of scientists by the Russian government under the guise of supporting the international bourgeoisie. He was exiled to Kazakhstan, where he worked as a zoologist until his death, which came just two years later, after he succumbed to a stroke. Ivanov's primate institute did continue on without him, though now they had new goals in mind, developing medicines for both tetanus and diphtheria. By the 1960s, it was an internationally renowned institution with over 2,000 apes, many of which were turned into space apes during the Russian Sputnik space program. As for Ivanov, he was posthumously cleared of all charges in 1959 and remembered for his achievements in artificial insemination and the great leaps he made with horses earlier on in his career, whilst his work attempting to hybridise apes with humans fell quietly by the wayside. With so many stories surrounding Ivanov, it becomes easy to imagine a Dr. Frankenstein figure toiling away in the small hours in a dimly lit laboratory in order to create a monstrous half-man, half-ape hybrid in an isolated, snow-covered Russian laboratory. In fact, Ivanov only visited the Russian primate centre once, in 1928. He stayed at the facility for three days during an inspection, at the time of which there was not a single great ape specimen housed at the centre, Apes were notoriously difficult to keep alive in the early days of the Primatological Institute's founding, with a life expectancy of one year, and were incredibly difficult to obtain when trying to build an initial stock. The single female volunteer, known as G, never visited the centre, and the government put a stop to any further experiments when they arrested Ivanov and he found himself promptly exiled. Whilst his earlier realised and planned experiments in Africa certainly lived up to the dark stories that circulate today, his latter involvement back in Russia is considerably overblown. One of the overriding questions regarding Ivanov's project is just why would a government whose tight controls on the movement of people both into and out of the country allow Ivanov to travel to French Guinea to participate in a project that would be both controversial and incredibly costly at a time when money was in short supply and while seeking international respect and diplomatic recognition? In 2005, the Scotsman published an article entitled Stalin's Half-Man, Half-Ape Super Warriors. They used Ivanov's research as a basis for a fantastical plot wherein Stalin schemed to produce an army of ape-human hybrids, a super soldier that would be used as a pawn in his overarching plan to take over the world. This all, of course, came out in top-secret documents that had been recently discovered. This entirely fictional account has been touted around by over-enthusiastic, self-published authors, cable channel TV shows and creationist ministers the world over ever since, gaining a place in mainstream folklore. But did it have any basis in reality at all? After all, the Soviets backed Ivanov for a reason. The truth is, of course, a little more complicated, but not really any less bizarre. We can quickly write off some of the lesser points from the Scotsman's article, Details such as the oft-repeated notion that the Soviet documents unearthed were top secret. Ivanov's research was not particularly secret during its day and was written about in the international press, so that pretty much cleared that one up. As to the whys and wherefores, however, things get a little more murky and span several prongs. Throughout the early 20th century, Russia had been a remarkably complicated place in regards to its politics. Undoubtedly, one of the most important moments in regards to Ivanov and his hybridization project was the October Revolution of 1917, which saw Trotsky and Lenin's Bolshevik party storm the Winter Palace and take over the country, founding Soviet Russia under the banner All Power to the Soviets. One of the main theories suggests that after the revolution, 
Ivanov found invigorated support from his experiments within the new Bolshevik government, whose ideologies loosely aligned with the ramifications of Ivanov's proposals to hybridize humans and apes. During this time, Trotsky and Lenin were busy waging a war against religion. Openly hostile towards religion and officially atheist, Lenin once famously stated in a letter written in 1913 that all religion is a necrophilia and claimed that there can be nothing more abominable than religion. This anti-religion of the Bolsheviks was essentially a bastardization of a Marxist philosophy that morphed into the Trotsky-Leninist concept, vilifying organized religion as a bourgeois construct to exploit the working class. After they took power, the Bolshevik rulers heavily persecuted organized religion, founding societies such as the Militant Godless, who disseminated anti-religious propaganda throughout the Soviet Union. It was this propaganda war that Ivanov's work was expected to benefit the most, and if you follow the theory, was one of the central reasons the Bolsheviks backed the project at all. If Ivanov could artificially inseminate an ape and create a hybridized offspring, it could help to prove evolutionary theory that man evolved from ape and would land a decisive blow upon religion, bolstering the materialism and atheism that the government were heavily pushing. This might seem like a pretty out there solution, but it also had many other knock-on effects. Ivanov's science was pioneering and it would prove the superiority of the Soviet science to the world, whilst also it potentially paved the way for another Trotskyite utopian dream that man would have a hand in his own evolution, creating the new Soviet man, with insemination and reproduction entirely fractured from the bourgeois constructs of love and family. It was, as far as the theory goes, the next obvious step in human evolutionary theory. Whilst these theories aim to understand why the Bolsheviks initially backed Ivanov, they are not supported by all scholars universally. Oleg Shishkin, a Russian author and journalist, developed his own theories based upon his belief that the aging Bolshevik top brass were interested in a rather bizarre scientific curiosity from the early 20th century dubbed rejuvenation therapy, being pioneered in France by Russian-born, French naturalized scientist and surgeon Sergei Voronov. And if things seem weird so far, Voronov's studies take things straight off the deep end. Born in Russia in 1866, but emigrating to France after his graduation, Sergei Voronov had a pretty unique career. After living and working in Egypt for 14 years between 1896 and 1910, researching the negative effects of castrations on eunuchs, Voronov returned to France with a whole new set of pioneering theories. In short, his ideas were rooted in his belief that there was a relation between hormonal activity and the effects of aging. This was a radical concept at the time, but perhaps even more radical was where Voronov took his theories. In 1913, Voronov became the first surgeon to utilize xenotransplantation using primate organs when he grafted the thyroid gland of a chimpanzee into a 13-year-old boy and then watched his progress over the period of 14 months. By the end of the study, he noted that the boy had gained in almost every physical area, growing in weight, height and colour, as well as intelligence. A few years later, he began grafting primate testicles into the scrotums of human males in order to rejuvenate them in numerous ways. In his book, published in 1925, titled Rejuvenation by Grafting, he states that his grafting surgery could improve one's sex drive, induce better memory, provide extra energy, allowing the recipient to work longer hours. It improved the muscles around the eye, negating the need to wear glasses, and worked as a benefit to sufferers of schizophrenia. During his initial research and practical experiments, Voronov had grafted the testicles of younger animals onto older animals in order to regenerate their natural vigour. After performing over 500 of these transplants on various animals, including bulls, goats and sheep, he set his sights higher and considered the possibility that he could do the same in humans if he grafted the testicles taken from monkeys. His first successful graft was performed in 1920 when he transplanted thin slices of testy into the scrotum of a human. Unbelievably, this practice became a fashionable procedure known as rejuvenation therapy, though it was far better received in France than it was in Britain, where long-running debates on animal rights had already outlawed such surgeries in the decades prior. 
Regardless, the elite from around the world, including Britain, visited Voronov to undergo the surgery with the hopes of regaining their youth. The demand for the procedure was so high that Voronov had his own primate nursery built in Italy to supply him with fresh testicles. Perhaps realising that he was only making money from half of the population, Voronov moved on to experimenting with the ovaries of apes in women, grafting them into humans in efforts to delay the menopause. In 1924, he operated on a 48-year-old woman from Sao Paulo, Brazil, who had been left by her husband. Reportedly, she desired to go under Voronov's knife in order to regain her youth, and with it, her husband's lost affection. The operation apparently was a roaring success, so much so that the woman moved on from her husband, saying that he was not worthy of her new youthful beauty. It was around this time that his work intersected with that of Ilya Ivanov. Whilst Ivanov was in France securing the use of the Pasteur Institute's African facilities, he teamed up with Voronov, who had transplanted human ovaries into a female ape named Nora, and the pair attempted to artificially inseminate her using human sperm. The experiment was an eventual failure, despite initial reports that the pregnancy had been progressing normally. Eventually, as science continued to progress, and a better understanding of testosterone and its role in ageing and virility became the subject of a deeper study, Voronov's work became slowly sidelined and eventually ridiculed, first by the scientific community, closely followed by public opinion. As early as 1929, the press had begun calling out Voronov's claims and likening his practices to old sorcerers from the Dark Ages. It seems strange that whenever critics raise their voices against these modern magicians, they answer, but it is for the good of humanity. But science and sentiment do not always go hand in hand. The realm of experimental surgery is a fascinating one. It is, however, also dangerous. The experimenter is apt to forget his humanity and his zeal. It is no imaginary menace. My operation, says Dr. Voronov, confers upon the subject of it a vigorous life that lasts until a deferred old age, which comes speedily and ends with a painless death. Long life, prolonged youth, painless death. These are boons that all humanity would crave. Can they be had in exchange for a big fee and a Voronov operation and magic of the age of the philosopher's stone? By the time of his death in 1951, his work had completely fallen out of favour and become all but ridiculed. His reputation would not entirely recover until the 1990s when much of his theory was revisited and certain sections were in fact seen to be potentially beneficial, though perhaps not quite the miracle elixir that Voronov had claimed in his prime. Whilst Ivanov and Voronov never did succeed in creating a human-ape hybrid, there have been numerous claims since of top-secret projects, covered up and lost in time, that purportedly did succeed. One such project, which it is claimed took place in the 1920s and would have been operating in parallel with Ivanov's research, was not actually done by the Soviets, but in fact, it was American scientists in Florida who were creating the chimeras. Whilst we have documented evidence for both Ivanov and Voronov's research and work in the area of creating human-ape hybrids, there have been several claims over the years that are backed with less than stellar evidence. In 2018, Gordon G. Gallup Jr., psychologist at the University of Albany, made extraordinary claims that the world's first human-ape hybrid was in fact born in 1920, in an institute in Florida. The facility that allegedly carried out the project was the Anthropoid Breeding and Experiment Station, a precursor to the Yerkes National Primate Research Center. This center is the largest and earliest such facility established in America, and it was originally founded in 1930 by Robert Yerkes in Orange Park, Florida, before relocating in 1965 to its present location on the Emory University campus in Atlanta. The report, given to British tabloid newspaper The Sun by Gallup Jr., was, as one might expect, rife with errors, such as the claim that the Yerkes' institute moved to Atlanta in 1930, when in fact it was 1965. Mixing up such basic facts does not really bode well for the rest of the story, but nevertheless, it goes on to quote Gallup's claims. One of the most interesting cases involved an attempt which was made back in the 1920s 
in what was the first primate research center established in the US, in Orange Park, Florida. They inseminated a female chimpanzee with human semen from an undisclosed donor and claimed not only that pregnancy occurred, but the pregnancy went full term and resulted in a live birth. But in the matter of days or a few weeks, they began to consider the moral and ethical considerations and the infant was euthanized. Gallup Jr. claimed to have been told this story by his old professor, whom he assured was a credible scientist in his own right. It goes without saying that with so scant details and with a source as devastatingly tragic as the sun, the story leaves much to be desired in terms of hard evidence. But it's curious nonetheless to consider what motivation a scientist such as Gallup, whose early work on primate self-recognition and self-awareness was groundbreaking in its day, would have to be involved in such a story if it had no shred of evidence in truth. One other claim that lies in equal evidential obscurity comes from 1967 inside Maoist China. Similarly to Gallup's story, this too was reported on in the newspapers, though almost 40 years earlier. Originally published in 1980 and syndicated throughout the early months of 1981 with the headline... Chinese aim to implant human sperm in chimps. The story grew out of a press report from Shanghai newspaper Wen Ai Bao that addressed the Chinese authorities' current debates on reigniting the long-forgotten humanate crossbreeding program and it quoted one of the original researchers from the project, Dr. Zhi Yongzhang. The chimp was three months pregnant before the first experiment was halted, one of the original researchers claims. The creatures could be used for herding sheep and cows and driving carts, he said, and they could be used in exploring space, the bottom of the sea, and exploring mines. Much like Ivanov, his experiments were brought to an abrupt end during the Cultural Revolution, when in 1967 the Maoist government smashed up the laboratory and exiled Ji Yongzhang and one other unnamed doctor he worked with to a farm for ten years. The pregnant chimp claimed Ji went on to die through neglect before it was able to carry out its full term. He also said a factory could be set up to provide parts from the near-human ape. The doctor also spoke of the possibility of transplanting heads. At the same time of the ape-human experiments, he recalled, researchers in Harbin were trying to transplant the heads of dogs. A transplant from a human to a new creature could be beneficial in that the intelligence of a man can still be used. Though there are shades of Frankenstein's monster in his proposals, G claims it should not be offensive now that artificial organs are implanted and organic organs, theoretically, are deemed better. G said the idea of a near-human ape was to serve the needs of mankind. Using human sperm for such an experiment is ethically all right, he said, because it is produced anyway, and most of it is wasted. Resisting the urge to make jokes in regards to wasting human sperm, it is... Nevertheless, an interesting article, despite its lack of comparative evidence. Ji also alluded to the idea that there were prior experiments taking place in China long before his time, and when considering the timescale of Ivanov's experiments, it doesn't seem like a claim that would have put such projects out of step with the science of the time. After these two claims, stories continue further downhill into rumour and fiction with claims which quickly disappear down the rabbit holes of cryptozoology, Bigfoot and superhuman ape warriors. One such story is that of Zana, a human primate, or possibly leftover Neanderthal hybrid of some kind that lived in a remote Russian village and bred with the local men. Later exhumations and subsequent DNA tests proved that the stories were simply the mischaracterization of a tragic human mistreated due to physical and mental handicaps. Whether or not they have any evidence to support them, it's certainly true that the stories of human-ape hybrids still continue unabated. As popular now as they were in Greek mythology, chimeras and hybrids still bring the same fundamental fears and morbid intrigue as they ever did. Science still marches on, and the quest to hybridise humans has never really stopped. Whether it be in the pages of lost history during the founding years of some of the world's most prominent facilities, buried within secret Chinese laboratories, or continued in the open today in countries that still allow for such experiments. Indeed, in 2017, Juan Carlos Belmonte, professor of the Gene Expression Laboratories of the Salks Institute for Biological Studies, 
created the world's first human-pig hybrid embryo, and in 2019, over a century after Ivanov's proposals to the Zoological Congress in Graz, the first human-monkey hybrid embryo was reportedly created in research that would potentially aid in human organ transplants. As controversial as ever, the embryo was created with fail-safes to ensure that they could not survive past a certain time frame, even if they could survive at all. A century on, and it seems the realisation of a hybrid human is still mired in the same scientific difficulties and moral quandaries as it ever was, and many might suggest that it stay there for another century yet. Human-ape hybrids, ladies and gentlemen. I really like this week's episode. I, I really thought it was like a nice change of pace, but I, I really liked it. it um, after the last sort of few weeks, well, actually for, for quite a while now, we've been sort of concentrating on kind of similar topics. So I really wanted to kind of branch off and do something a little bit different this week. And, and I, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the research for it. I quite enjoy the research of not necessarily debunking, because I don't think that's what we did, but you take these kind of folkloric stories like, you know, the human, Stalin's human warriors, human ape warriors, and, and you kind of get to the bottom of what, what was really there. And and l- like almost always, what's really there is is actually more interesting than Stalin's human ape warriors, you know? So, it, yeah, I really enjoyed this week's episode. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, more about that after these short adverts. So the adverts can be a little bit different this week, and it comes with a little story attached, which I'm going to try and bash through as quickly as possible. But last week I was contacted by a listener named Paul um, from Ireland, and Paul basically said that he works for a company named Carvon that make leather goods, a lot of stationary goods and things like that, Um, iPad cases, notebook cases, things along that line. Um, and they're all kind of personalised and whatnot. And um, he basically, he'd, he'd made a Dark Histories one, which was amazing, using like the Dark Histories butterfly logo and everything. And, and he basically just said, you know, I'd like to send it to you just to say thanks for, for making the episodes, which was incredibly generous of him. So, of course, I was like jumped on it because I, I use a notebook almost daily. Um, you know, whenever I'm work, well, well, when I'm working on the podcast, I, I absolutely use a notebook. And my notebook is a Harry Potter one from Aldi that cost me about two pound. So I was like, you know, I, I don't get me wrong. I love Harry Potter, but it, it's not the most professional looking notebook in the world. So, so of course, I, yeah, I emailed him back saying, you know, I, that would be incredible. Thank you very much. But it, it, sort of, I, I, I wanted to return the favour somehow and say like, you know, um, I can run your, your, your company's, I can run an advert, you know, if you'd like, because it's my show and I can do what I want. You know, and that's that's part of the joy. And I and I love working with listeners in this way. You know, being able to promote listeners' kind of companies and and what they do. And 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 you know, I, I it just makes it more of a communal feel. Um, and he actually said, "Don't worry about it." Like he, he, he that's you know, he wanted it not to become like a business thing. And I was like, "That's that's fine. Don't worry. I'll, you know, just let me know and I'll chuck it in there. No worries." Um, and then he came back to me. He spoke to his boss about it a little bit, and they said, "Yeah." So. I got an advert for Carvon, which they're, they're a really cool company. They're from Ireland. And yeah, they have like a, a range of leather personalized goods. Um, and that they're all made from like premium vegetable tan leather using sort of traditional and modern techniques. That they're, they're all sort of like sort of really nicely stitched. But at the same time, the, the personalization on the one that he sent me with the Dark Histories podcast, it was all kind of like sort of like laser etched in there sort of thing or, or, that's my guess because it was really detailed like even the butterfly was like perfectly etched into the leather it was amazing so yeah they, they take sort of custom orders um I, I believe they do it for sort of corporate and individual as well which is really cool um most order quantities they say are made and shipped within 24 hours and their products make great gifts for all occasions apparently which i have to actually like like that's the kind of blurb that they sent me um but I have to say it's true because Paul made this as a gift for me and it's a great gift. It was amazing. It was more than great. Like, I'm not just blowing smoke here. Like, I want to run this advert because I was really kind of taken aback by Paul's generosity and sending this to me, like, as a kind of thing just to say thanks for making the show. And um, and I, and it's a really nice smoke book. And, and not only that, but it smells really nice as well because it's made of leather. So, like, I'm not sure if that's me just being a weird fetishist or something, but 
Like, I, I, it's nice just to smell it. But yeah, it's a really well-made notebook as well. It's, it's tough. It's, it's nice leather. And above all else, he's a Dark Histories listener and big fan. So, you know, we support our own here at Dark Histories. That's, that's my opinion anyway. And they got a team of designers, you know, and they can sort of use your custom artwork and all that kind of stuff. If you are interested in getting that kind of customised leather goods, basically, go check them out. Um, they got a website. It's it's just carvon.com, which is C-A-R-V-E-O-N.com. And yeah, they're great. So I'm, I'm super chuffed with my notepad. I put, put I, I Instagrammed it and I very rarely do social media, as you all know how bad I am at that. But I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. So <laughs> yeah, um, so thanks very much, Paul, for starters, for, for sending me the notepad. That's really cool. And secondly, everyone go check out carvon.com um, if you're looking for personalized leather goods. They're really cool and they're Dark Histories listeners, so you, you can't go wrong with that. They're basically like me and you. Welcome back. So yeah, that was a, a really cool episode. I really enjoyed that. I, I really enjoyed the, the say that, I think I've mentioned it a couple of times now, but it was just a nice kind of change of pace for me. I think the next couple of episodes, actually, I'm I'm really looking forward to all of them. Um, I've been working on a, a few kind of in tandem and, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to the next couple of episodes, like getting really into them now. Because obviously I work on one sort of as a main episode and I work on others kind of on the periphery when I get bored of working on just one thing at a time. But then obviously one sort of takes over and becomes the main one. So I'm really looking forward to getting into it, especially next week's one. Um, I think that one's going to be a really fun story. But anyway, let's talk about more about Ivanov. That was bonkers, wasn't it? The re- whole rejuvenation therapy, I that, that was difficult to explain all that without curling my toes. I never want to read another line like slicing testes. I mean, oh, even now just makes my ass cheeks like clench it's uh but it was it was a good story i liked it i i i i was um quite surprised by how open it was spoken about back in the day when i found the old newspaper reports of it back in sort of like the 19 throughout basically the 1910s and the 1920s i think honestly on, honestly speaking i would say it's more controversial today than it was then quite considerably which is you might not expect i suppose in some ways you might expect it because we've or we tend to believe that we're a bit more morally kind of superior now than we were back then and that we know a little better and things like that but interestingly it's the the kind of religious morals that that i think are more strongly against it now than they were back then uh so i I thought that was quite interesting but ultimately it, it did feel a little bit like it was one of those episodes a bit like when I did... I remember when I did the Ancient Egypt episode about the Tutankhamun's curse and that, and how it felt like a hundred years later and nothing has really changed. Like, like a lot of what I was researching, although it was obviously old newspapers and you could tell by the way it was written, a lot of the sentiment is exactly the same as today. You know, almost, you know, you, you have like the same sort of groups getting the same sort of angry about the same sorts of things and protesting in the same sorts of ways. I, I thought that was really interesting, the way nothing has really changed in, in, in the space of like 110 years it, from just about all aspects. I thought that was really interesting. Even the science hasn't really changed because you've still got scientists, scientists today that are kind of more sceptical than others about the whole hybridization thing. And, and you would have thought that after all this time that maybe there would be slightly more of a consensus, but there's not, you know, there's still just as much questions, although a lot of it, I mean, I, I did, so, so obviously one of the first things I wanted to do was read if this was even possible today. Like, for example, of course we know back in 1910s and 1920s that they were trying it and that Ivanov was trying to do this, but I wanted to know that if now we can look back on that and say, well, we know that wasn't going to work because of X reason, for example, and and there are some things that I could understand that that obviously he was he was never going to this was never going to succeed, but it's not that cut and dry. And the th- the, the problem was was that a, a lot of I mean I'm I'm not a biologist I'm not a chemist I'm, I'm basically not a scientist, so you know a lot of it was going over my head and it started talking about quite complicated biochemistry and and things like that and genetics and that that were just well over my head. I mean, I can get 
simple concepts, like when they were talking about the number of chromosomes and all the rest of it, that's, you know, for a layman, me and you can grasp that, right? But but at a certain point, it goes, you, you, you start reading into academic papers and they're just shooting above your head, right? It's just the way it is. And a lot of, I think, the arguments sort of left me behind at that point. So I'm not really sure if people were sort of against it or for or against the idea that it could have worked. But it, but, but what, what was interesting is whether or not you, could, you can understand it or not. Like I say, I can understand it. You might have a better understanding of it. I don't know. And if you do, then feel free to explain it to me in a sort of layman's terms. But yeah, what I found interesting was that there was still, like even for, for me, that not really understanding what they were saying from a scientific point of view, I could still understand that there was debate and that there was not really a consensus. Um, so that was quite interesting. That say, like, you expect that sort of stuff to be ironed out by now, but say over 100 years later and people are still having the same debates about whether or not it would have been successful, which is, you know, surprising and interesting. So, yeah, I thought it was good. Foreignoff was an absolute nutcase. I've read quite a bit more about Foreignoff, actually, and I was talking to my dad about it. Uh, he came over for coffee this evening and, and I was telling him all about it. And he was he actually had heard of this rejuvenation therapy and he was saying to me like, yeah, yeah, and it was still big in the 60s, apparently. Like there were a few people that he mentioned that, that you know, quite famous people that had apparently were sort of dabbling in the idea of rejuvenation therapy. I don't know if so much they were getting like testicles grafted into their sacks, but they were um, getting a lot of uh, injections and things like that. And that's how it started, actually. Um, I think the first person that tried the idea of rejuvenation therapy, which I, d- I didn't include in the episode, but was a, a French guy and I think he crushed up like dried dog's testicles or something like that um, and, and injected it into himself. So the, the first rejuvenation therapy experiments um, were by injections. And, and yeah, my dad was like, oh, you know, I've heard of that. Yeah, um, you know, in the 60s, there were still famous people that were injecting kind of hormones and stuff like that into themselves from animals um, in order to kind of become kind of like sexually more vigorous and more kind of energy and enthusiasm for their work and stuff like that, which is bonkers. But I mean, his whole experiments were absolutely insane. I constantly had Dr. Malcolm in my head with the Jurassic Park quote of scientists were too busy trying to see if they could to think about whether they should. Just, just, just the, the whole. I mean, that that really just sums up this whole kind of episode. Really, like perhaps, perhaps you just shouldn't do this, yeah, lads. But yeah, that pretty much sums up the entire episode. I think, like that, you know, the, that 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 line of thinking is, is pretty much the entire episode. But yeah, I think that's really about it. But yeah, that was that episode. Really, um, I thought it was really interesting, pretty bonkers, really. Next week's episode, say it's going to be really exciting. I'm really looking forward to it. So look forward to that. Otherwise, if you want to contact me and explain chromosomes and such, <laughs> you can do so at contact.darkhistories.com. I believe I've sorted out my email issues now. For a long time, I had some email problems. And I'm pretty sure I've solved them now. So I should be getting emails like normal. Um, so yeah, you can contact me there or you can get in touch with me on Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, Otherwise, you can find actually find links to all of that stuff in the show notes and on the website as well, which is darkhistories.com. And the website is, as always, the best place to go. It's like the hub for everything, including ways that you can support if you would like to do that. If you would not like to support, then please do go ahead and share, like, review, all that kind of jazz. That would be fantastic because that equally supports the podcast in, you know, other non-financial ways. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks very much for listening and downloading as always. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Cheers. Sleep tight.
many of which were turned into space apes during the Russian Sputnik space program. <laughs> oh, I can't say this with a straight face. 